Tonight on Arizona's Family News at 8, the search is on for a man seen in surveillance video wanted in connection with the brutal killing of a 29-year-old Valley woman. The desperate plea tonight from her family. And a section of the I-10 could be shut down for the next two days after a deadly and fiery semi-crash caused major damage to an overpass. And for years, one part of Arizona hasn't had enough ambulances. Now they're short on paramedics. What this means if you call 911. She woke up that day just so happy and we just can't imagine what could have happened to her. An emotional plea from the family and friends of 29 year old Lauren Heike. Tonight, they are desperate to find the person who killed their loved one. Police say she was ambushed from behind and killed while on a hike Friday off a popular trail in northeast Phoenix. Here's a look at a map on where this attack happened. It was on a trail known as Reach 11 near Scottsdale Road and Mayo Boulevard. The trail is this yellow area right here. It's a desert area with just a few homes that line the trail. Her body was found right about there. Today, her parents flew into the valley begging anyone with information to come forward. Steven Sarabia is tracking this story. He's live tonight with more. Steven. Yeah, this community is on edge. I spoke to people walking in this trail. They're walking it in groups. They're walking it in pairs. They're even walking it with animals <laughs> in the hopes that whoever did this gets caught soon. A family pleading for answers. She was my little girl. I'm going to miss her terribly. It's okay, honey. Um, I just hope they can find whoever did this to her. 29 year old Lauren Heike's body was found over the weekend off the Reach 11 trail in Northeast Phoenix. Police believe she was originally attacked from behind Friday morning. They're releasing this short surveillance clip of who they believe is the suspect as the search for this person continues. On Wednesday, Lauren's parents, Lana and Jeff Heike, flew into the valley from Washington to not only push for answers, but also remember the daughter they love. We is horrific. I'm sorry. As hard as this is for us, we're we're grateful because we had such a beautiful child. The incident happening along this trail, it's just a short walk to this nearby neighborhood. We took a quick walk in the area and found one of these signs. It's warning people not to walk alone in the area and also report suspicious activity. And as you can see, the investigation is also posted on the sign. Those who live in the area still shaken up following this tragedy. I would say the neighborhood's just a little bit somber right now. Um, and probably, you know, a little sketched out. Her parents remain heartbroken as they want everyone to remember Lauren for who she was. We, we want her to just, just be remembered and we want people to help and just know she's so beautiful and sweet. The suspect is described as either six eight or six foot tall, wearing gray or light colored shirt, dark pants, and a dark backpack. We really, really are begging people Please, to come forward. Please, if you know something, come forward. Phoenix police aren't confirming if this was a random attack or if the two knew each other. If you have any information, you are urged to contact police. Back to you. Steven Sarabia reporting tonight. Now, our True Crime Arizona team just released a detailed podcast with everything we know so far about this case, including more from the victim's family, friends, and detectives. The podcast is free, and it's available on all major platforms. Another bizarre turn in the trial of Lori Vallow, the former Chandler mom accused in the deaths of her two kids. Today, one of her former friends says Lori threatened to kill her. According to testimony today, this happened in October 2019. That is a month after authorities believe Vallow's children, JJ and Tylee, were killed. The friend, Audrey Baratiero, told the court that when she was ending her friendship with Lori, Lori threatened to kill her and cut her up. We know that Lori's daughter had been dismembered. Another part of the story had echoes of how JJ was killed. But then she didn't want to have to because it would be so messy and there would be so, so much blood and the, the bleach and something about trash bags. And that she, and that she would bury me worse. She would, no one would ever find me. 
We now know JJ, that was JJ wrapped in those garbage bags and buried. He died of asphyxia. The bodies of JJ and Tylee were found buried in Vallow's husband's Chad Daybell's Idaho backyard. The man accused of kidnapping and killing six-year-old Isabel Sellis in 2012 will go back on trial this year. Christopher Clement's new trial is going to start Tucson September 12th. His first trial ended in a hung jury after jurors could not reach a decision on the first-degree murder charge. He's already serving a life sentence for the murder of another girl, 13-year-old Mary Bell Gonzalez. Investigators found the bodies of both girls in a rural part of Pima County. Turning to southeastern Arizona, where ADOT is estimating it's going to take about two days to fully reopen the I-10 westbound after a deadly crash involving a semi. This happened overnight near Wilcox, near the border with New Mexico. DPS says a semi truck hit a support pillar and caught fire, causing major damage to the overpass for State Route 191. The driver was killed. Here's a map of where this crash happened exactly. Eastbound lanes of the I-10 have reopened heading towards New Mexico, but drivers heading west towards Tucson are looking at several extra hours of travel time until ADOT can get everything fixed. We aren't going to let the public travel on a roadway that isn't safe. So we're asking drivers to, uh, you know, pack their patience and to obey the speed limit uh, due to all this extra traffic that's going to be on that highway. There are no nearby alternate routes, so traffic is being uh, diverted to the south on two lane highways all the way to Douglas and then back up through Tombstone. ADOT says there's going to be a lot of truck traffic on those roads. Again, they project it will take about two days to fix. Five people, including three children, were rushed to the hospital tonight after a crash in Phoenix. This is near Encanto Boulevard and 43rd Avenue. Firefighters say a woman was thrown from her car. Three young kids were also hurt in this. They were all rushed to the hospital in critical condition, we're told. A man was also treated but is expected to be okay. Police say the intersection is shut down while they investigate. We've got new details on a story we've been covering all day. Police in Atlanta say they have a man in custody who they believe opened fire inside a medical office, killing one person and hurting four others. Sources are telling CBS News that 24 year old Dion Patterson was sitting in the waiting room for his appointment when he got agitated, pulled out a gun and started shooting. All five victims were women. The suspect's mother was with him. She was not shot. Law enforcement swarmed the medical building as reports of a mass shooter started coming in. We saw some cop cars coming up and people rushing into the building. Uh, they had some pretty heavy duty gear, assault rifles and uh, riot shields, things like that. And then it, it more and more just kept showing up until the whole street was just flooded with police. After an hours long manhunt, authorities were able to find Patterson north of the city of Atlanta. CBS News is reporting that Patterson was a Coast Guard veteran and was on medication for mental health issues. He was discharged from active duty at the beginning of this year. The Central Arizona Fire and Medical Authority says it's dealing with a big shortage of paramedics in Yavapai County. The fire chief says this comes after multiple years of not having enough ambulances in that area. Casey Torres working on this story tonight. And Casey, what does this shortage mean for people calling 911? Well, according to Fire Chief Scott Freitag, it means longer response times. He says a majority of the department's 911 calls are for advanced life support. That means they need a paramedic, not just an EMT. But under state law, CAFMA is not a license to operate their own ambulances. And that's why we're told they've relied on a privately owned company, Lifeline Ambulance, to provide the services and paramedics for years. However, Lifeline Ambulance tells us that there's been a nationwide shortage of paramedics starting before the pandemic that has trickled down to our area. Freitag says if Lifeline Ambulance can't provide a paramedic, then the fire department has to send one of their own and sometimes takes that takes their own equipment as well, which adds more time to the response time. Now, he claims there's been times where no ambulances were available at all. We've had to transport a stroke patient in the back of their private vehicle while being treated by our paramedic, their vehicle being driven by one of our firefighters because we didn't have another way to get them to the hospital. 
Up until recently, Lifeline Ambulance was the only company servicing the area. For the past couple of years, CAFMA has also been working with Priority Ambulance, who is also struggling to always provide a paramedic. Freitag says the ambulance companies bill the patient or their insurance provider for its services. However, CAFMA says if they send one of its own paramedics, they bill the ambulance company to reimburse them. Now, we're going to hear from both sides of this issue, including CAFMA's plans to possibly cut ties with Lifeline Ambulance. That's coming up at 9. For now, reporting live in the newsroom, Casey Torres, Arizona's Family.